Well, now the uh, coming to just the end of the session four, which is very much uh, uh, constructive in uh, the debate that we just had. And uh, now the, the session five, uh, let me start by again, welcoming all participants to, to this session. Uh, of course, uh, which we deal very much as well with the uh, big part of the topic of uh, our conference. Uh, but unlike other sessions, our speakers are all economists <laughs> by oh, training and by work and profession. So uh, they need no introduction as each of them uh, gain very much uh, the, uh, has a uh, her or his reputation in their respective uh, uh, background all along. So that's why I'm so happy to have all of them here to speak about the topic of our conference and particular of the topic of this uh, session. <clears throat> On one hand, I'm sure uh, they will speak about uh, what Asia or Asia integration will look like in uh, mid or and post uh, pandemic. Uh, some said the uh, Asia recovery uh, uh, will not be that soon as we hope. Uh, like many other part of the world, they also suffer with quite from this uh, pandemic crisis. Of course, some might do better than others, but overall, as we can see, no uh, easy task uh, as, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, very much uh, in terms of uh, uh, mobility of all sorts, uh, production disruption, very difficult to make a new project for investment. So that's why we turn very much uh, inward uh, to domestic, uh, 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 what do you call scene. That means it said perhaps a recovery has uh, to do uh, both uh, domestic and external. So that's something that uh, we could keep in mind while we're going on to debate in this session. That is it's still not that clear uh, what would be the kind of uh, recovery outcome. And if we add to that uncertainty of a uh, global economic order, we are not quite sure what we are going to get in as by the post pandemic world, well, you know, we have the new uh, WTO uh, Director General at the same time, in our region, we moved to uh, RCEP uh, as a mega deal, uh, quite, quite comprehensive for uh, trade uh, deal the past year. Uh, and, uh, and the other challenging issue I feel married to, to treat uh, by our district colleagues here uh, is it would be interesting to learn from some of the early session we had yesterday about the Indo-Pacific concept, if the economists in this session could uh, talk about, uh, as uh, uh, some panelists already said, uh, the Indo-Pacific is a strategy construct right from the beginning, unlike the Asia-Pacific uh, idea, which is more the economist proposal, it has become uh, more or less uh, uh, Asia Pacific uh, cooperation and integration, and also start to talk more about the Indo Pacific as a way to go. Uh, ASEAN also stem out the, you know, the uh, AOIP uh, the past two years. So, this is something that perhaps, uh, among other, of course, Indo Pacific initiative. So, this is perhaps the time as uh, panelists among these uh, five economists we have here to talk as well about the, what do you think about the Indo-Pacific uh, concept and perhaps Indo-Pacific, you know, the initiative, different initiative we have. Uh, so that's it we aside. Maybe you, you can come back with uh, your comments after. Uh, 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 the first speaker uh, of uh, this uh, session will be uh, uh, Professor Fukunari Kibura, uh, Chief Economist, of Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, and also Professor of Economics at Keio University, Japan. So Professor Kibura, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, let, let me share my screen. Um, does it look okay? Yeah, hopefully so. Okay. Yes, perfect. Right. Thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. I think when we talk about the Asia Pacific, uh, one big va vacuum is uh, its economic context. And actually, the reason is that uh, the connection between ASEAN East Asia and India South Asia is not very tight. Uh, as you know, that in ASEAN and East Asia, uh, we have so called factory Asia, particularly in the machinery industries, particularly in so called the second and banding. Uh, but it is, not, it is not really connected to uh, India and South Asia. Uh, but, but I think it's really uh, worthwhile talking about the economic context, particularly uh, for the future, uh, because uh, once we have an economic context, uh, then the story could be in. Uh, inclusion rather than exclusion. Well, we can talk about the mutually beneficial cooperation rather than confrontation. So, so I think uh, how we can build up a sort of economic context in India, uh, Asia Pacific, I think this is very important. So, so I'd like to talk about the can uh, India and South Asia take part in Factory Asia or not? Okay. Uh, just, uh, right. So I think that India and South Asia must come into factory Asia. This is my claim. Uh, ASEAN and East Asia have been a champion of utilizing the so-called mechanics of in, uh, IPNs or the second unbundling, particularly machinery industries in the past, uh, maybe two, three decades. And, but if you think of uh, manufacturing, uh, particularly in the context of uh, uh, India and S South Asia, Manufacturing is uh, still important for economic development. Uh, it generates massive jobs for uh, relatively poor people. So actually, we are not quite sure how far we can have a job creation in, on the line of a services industries, actually. So still, we need manufacturing. And also, manufacturing accelerates innovation and nurtures human capital. That's what we know. And also, manufacturing can go with IPNs at least for a decade or two. Uh, some people are talking about the reshoring uh, all uh, production activities may go back to developed countries with uh, uh, machines, uh, but actually the labor will continue to be uh, the most flexible and versatile uh, inputs for production, at least for a decade or two. So I think India and South Asia must take advantage of its, uh, its geographical position actually just sitting next to ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, yeah, that actually the current position of India in factory Asia, uh, despite, uh, despite uh, India's uh, splendid growth record, Actually, the India is obviously behind the utilization of IPN, so the second unbundling centered by machinery industries. Uh, other way to say, huge potential exists over there. And then what to do for participating in a factory Asia? Actually, this is already well documented, starting from so-called fragmentation theory, uh, initially proposed by Jones and Kiaskowski. We need two things, a reduction in production costs per se, that includes, say, uh, investment liberalization, facilitation, promotion, economic infrastructure services, uh, industrial agglomeration, and others. And also a reduction in so-called service link costs connecting remotely placed uh, production blocks. That includes trade liberalization, facilitation, logistics infrastructure, particularly for time-sensitive transactions. So uh, this is a diagram uh, looking at uh, uh, machinery trade for each country each country is exporting and importing machineries uh, that includes a general machinery electric machinery transportation equipment and also the precision machinery uh, red bar is an export side a proportion of machinery exports out of total exports and then blue one is an import side actually the stripe portion 
is uh, parts and components. And you can see uh, many uh, ASEAN and also East Asian countries are both exporting and importing uh, machineries, particularly parts and components. So it's not a really one-way trade, but it's a sort of uh, intra-industry trade. But actually, uh, we have a, a really fine-tuning division of labor across countries. So many countries are really successful in utilizing this kind of mechanics. Uh, but if you uh, look at the, the position of India, still in the middle, actually not really fully utilizing this kind of mechanics. So, so there's a lot of room for India to utilize this kind of mechanics. Um, right. Yeah, the, uh, this, this is actually the trade matrix in uh, 2019, only for machinery trade. Uh, the actual numbers are, are just usual metrics. Uh, rows are uh, exporting countries uh, and uh, columns are uh, uh, importing countries. Uh, you can see uh, certainly China is a big figure over there, uh, and, but, but actually if we have a predicted values, actually that is coming from a gravity equation exercise. So it's, it's like a sort of a, after controlling uh, from uh, economic sizes, GDP sizes, and the distance and others, and what to be a sort of a quote unquote normal world standard uh, flows. Uh, that's an predicted values. And you can see in China, uh, certainly uh, actual uh, figures are very big, but if you look at the predicted figures, for example, China's export to Japan or export to South Korea uh, are actually less than world standard. So uh, China is exporting to exporting machinery uh, machineries out, out of uh, the region a lot too. But to look at the ASEAN, uh, ASEAN is actually uh, ASEAN's role. And if you see that actually 200, 206% uh, side, export side. So ASEAN is more than double, uh, uh, double exports of uh, machineries vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, predicted values. And also import size is very big too, uh, 149%. And also ASEAN is really well connected to China, Japan, and South Korea. So this really uh, makes, makes us a sort of image that uh, really ASEAN is really committing to uh, international production networks in machinery industries. Uh, but to look at the India's uh, figures, as an export side, actually the exports are very, very small. Uh, say exports to China is only 4% of the predicted values, uh, to Japan only 6%, to South Korea 12%, uh, to ASEAN 41%, uh, to the world only 25%. And uh, in, India is actually importing machineries uh, but it's, uh, from China, 76%. It's not too big, actually, uh, less than the world standard, actually. Uh, so from Japan, 81%. From South Korea, this is big, 219. From ASEAN, this is big, 184. So what's going on is that actually, uh, India is uh, importing uh, parts and components uh, from East Asian countries and ASEAN, uh, but actually, uh, not really exporting. That means only for domestic consumption, basically. So it's a sort of an import substitution type industrial industrialization strategies are going on. Not really doing a sort of exporting and importing at the same time for machinery industries. So that really indicates a sort of uh, positioning of uh, India so far uh, in international production networks. Yeah, so this is a fragmentation theory. Uh, this is different from industry by industry division of labor. This is task by task division of labor. This is much more subtle. The actually the service link uh, connecting uh, production blocks is extremely important. So for example, parts and components trade is there. Uh, so it's not just uh, the matter of uh, monetary cost, transportation cost, but the time cost is extremely important. Reliability of logistics links uh, is uh, extremely important. So we really need a good service link uh, in order to sustain this kind of uh, the division of labor. Uh, that is what India and uh, South Asia should do. 
And I'd like to talk about uh, the connection with, uh, just a moment, I have to go to the next page. Uh, yeah. yeah, if you look at the sort of digital uh, aspects, uh, the certainly India is strong in doing various kinds of uh, services through uh, digital. Uh, but actually what's going on in uh, ASEAN and East Asia is actually by moving from uh, phase one to phase two. Uh, so phase one uh, up to probably two, 2015, platformers were developed with the expansion of internet connection. So it was a relatively easy expansion of the businesses over there, uh, particularly after the introduction of iPhone in the 2008. And actually relatively simplistic matching businesses grew at the exponential rates, say social media, e-commerce, and the market, market size, actually the market size or the number of customers matter a lot in the introduction of AI and machine learning and others. But the things are changing gradually, particularly after 2015 or so. Uh, some actually a platform has stepped into a tighter integration with the traditional industries, traditional businesses. So rejuvenation and the productivity quality upgrading in the trend, uh, traditional industries are actually uh, very important uh, jobs uh, for uh, platformers. So they actually, we have integration of various tasks, uh, super applications are coming in, and also customized deployment of digital technologies are very, getting very mo more important. So collaboration with a gradual innovation in the traditional industries, including manufacturing, may become more important from now on. Uh, so actually uh, maybe less links uh, with uh, market size. So it's so actually the, we have a big room for ex uh, developing the link between ASEAN East Asia and India uh, in this uh, context. So what can India and the South Asia uh, bring into factory Asia? One is that the East, East Asia and India, uh, South Asia, can take advantage of a combination of traditional industries, including manufacturing and, uh, and digital technology. Now, actually, in Indian uh, engineering industry is very, very special, very interesting, actually. So they are utilizing digital technology in the way something different from uh, East Asian companies. And, and also, uh, Obashi and Kimura, that is a, a one a small uh, econometric exercise. Actually, we pick up that uh, introduction of industrial robots uh, seems to accelerate network trading in East Asia. So, uh, reshoring argument is not there yet. Uh, still, we can uh, utilize manufacturing with digital technology. And also, uh, wider choices of network with uh, India and South Asia will enhance. Uh, robustness and resilience of LPNs or second unbundling. LPNs should be expanded to India and South Asia. Actually, that will enhance the robust, robustness and uh, resilience of uh, production networks. Uh, and Kimura and Obashi actually doing uh, the resilience of uh, LPNs under COVID-19. That was robust, but we need more uh, diversification of uh, business models. Uh, that, so the inclusion of India and South a Asia is a big plus for us. The last page uh, references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kibora, uh, for uh, providing us uh, uh, a bit uh, evidence-based research, uh, what you had done over the years. Uh, this is very important uh, to, to me and I think to many of us, uh, it is important to remind uh, the lesson from ASEAN, you know, what we had done over the years in order to integrate into factory Asia, uh, into uh, a production network, and, and now the second unbundling, as you said, uh, for machinery in the case of India and South Asia is important, is about time. I remember even the, you know, if looking back, uh, you know, in the 80s and 90s when we uh, still, uh, you know, the young graduate and, and, and study and we look at all these uh, ASEAN export led uh, industrialization. And uh, uh, this is uh, machinery is, is one of the most important it took whatever uh, decades and, and I think it's, uh, it's important to remind 
if South Asia and India would like to integrate it in whatever we call now Indo-Pacific integration, is it important to have this, uh, uh, you know, uh, at least a machinery in mind? And, and plus you show now we're moving to the di digital uh, uh, in, uh, business, uh, digital digitalization uh, of any industry. This is even more important and uh, catching up. Uh, better coming now later than waiting later. So I think that's kind of message I 